Excellent. Okay, um, well, thank you again uh, for joining today. Uh, we have a similar agenda for our time together um, as we did last month. So after a quick welcome and review of our last discussion, um, we're gonna have some brief comments from Mark, Chris, and Sarah um, to help provide some context for our discussion around uh, sustainability opportunities and engagement, as well as an update from Emma, Natalie, and Michael on the most recent student subcommittee discussion. We'll then take a, a little time to review the engagement focus areas that we distributed earlier this week before leaving last 50 minutes or an hour or so for group discussion. So bulk of our time together in our group discussion. Um, before we dive in, I do just wanna take one second <laughs> and acknowledge that uh, this is a new year, uh, but a lot of the things that made last year so challenging are still with us um, today. And perhaps even new events are adding additional stress um, and anxiety um, to people outside of their work lives. So um, really just wanted to do, call that out, acknowledge it, and for the most part, just thank everyone um, for, for joining us here today, taking a little mental effort to be with us and, and for your work you've done thus far um, and we'll continue to do on the council. Um, as last time, we're not going to do a big round of introductions. This is just a reminder of who is here with us today. Um, I want to take at least a second um, and call out that we've got a couple new members who are, who are filling in for folks who couldn't um, make it today. So um, Alex Pierce is here with us. She's the Director of Communications in the Office of Vice Chancellor for Finance Administration, um, supporting um, John Horn um, with us today. And then um, Jake Smith, who's filling in for NOLA, um, who is the Secretary for the Academic Staff. So thank you both uh, for joining us and for filling in. Appreciate it. So checking in on our timeline quick, um, where we're at, we're in the middle of our kind of opportunity evaluation. And today we're gonna focus our discussion around opportunities uh, in the category of engagement. Uh, like last month, our goal for today is gonna be to discuss the focus areas we distributed, flesh out a little bit more about what challenges we might face um, or resources we could leverage to realize them all setting up for the same kind of homework that we had for last month, which is a short survey with some initial thoughts on prioritization. Quickly on our discussion last time, we reviewed the um, academic and research focus areas. Um, in those group discussions, we didn't identify any new focus areas um, to add to the list. Um, so the follow-up survey asked folks for just their initial thoughts on prioritization of, of those, those seven. Here, I just wanna show the, the results uh, of that survey. Again, a, a low number indicates a higher um, priority. So this is kind of the average ranking um, of the different um, focus areas. Um, we're not gonna dive into this in detail right now. We have time set aside in our April and May meetings to do just that and combine the results of this with our discussions on engagement operations and planning administration. But we wanted to one, at least show the preliminary results. Two, thank you again for taking the time um, to fill out the survey, as well as let you know in the follow-up materials from this meeting we're gonna send out um, next week, we'll include these results as well as a little bit more information on the distribution of the results as well. Last bit of, of update since last time, um, we also sent out uh, what we call a short kind of pulse survey to all the individuals who registered for any of the listening sessions that we held back in October. So we wanted to one, give those individuals who are interested in our, in our process an update on what we've done, but also ask for another opportunity for feedback and kind of open up continuing opportunities for feedback from the community on this. So in the survey we sent out to um, listening session attendees, um, we um, asked them to identify which of the focus areas in academic and research that we discussed that they thought should be priorities. We didn't ask them to rank them, just to pick you know, one, zero, all seven that they thought should be high priority for, for campus. This is the, the, the quick snapshot of the results of the counts um, for each priority that one of the, the survey respondents um, selected. Now, as you can see here, we only have a small number of responses. We had seven people who responded to the survey, so very small sample size, three students, three staff, three, uh, one alumni. Um, my last comment here is that the survey is gonna stay open through at least next week. So if any of you have um, stakeholders or colleagues you think that would want to either fill this out or provide any other comments or feedback to us, um, please feel free to share it. The link is up on the website, but I will include a link to it and in follow-up materials um, as well. So that is it for my kind of quick summary of what happened last time. Um, any questions on that? If not, I'm going to hand it off to our not really guest speakers, but <laughs> folks help setting this up.
Well, great. I will stop sharing um, and hand it off to uh, Mark, Sarah, and Chris, who would like to go first, um, provide a little wisdom for us before we get into our discussions. Uh, you didn't say we had to provide wisdom. That, that's a new word. Uh, so, <laughs> okay. Um, I, I, we didn't talk about who'd go first. Is it, should I just start, Chris and Sarah? And then, okay, all right. So um, we are uh, providing just a few comments on engagement. And uh, briefly, we decided to uh, divide that between the three of us, uh, largely by the, um, some of the constitu constituencies we work with mostly. So I'm gonna speak uh, mostly about student engagement. Um, in fact, that's in my title, Associate Vice Chancellor for Leadership and Engagement. So, uh, so that seemed appropriate for student affairs. So, um, so just a few minutes on that, and then I'll turn it over to uh, Chris, maybe, that in the order that we were on, the, and then we can end with Sarah. So, um, but from a student engagement perspective, broadly, and then uh, begin to make some connections to sustainability as well. But broadly, um, I think about it in um, three um, categories uh, as we engage in uh, our engagement work, uh, uh, do our engagement work uh, with students. Uh, and uh, at, um, let me describe those three and I'll go back in more detail. So uh, broadly uh, from this, uh, thinking about engaging students as the entire student body. So um, a broad engagement strategy, uh, then kind of a smaller engagement strategy, the next tier up would be the students we work with to actually do the work to pr pr produce the programs or the services, the opportunities for engagement, students that actually wanna you know, yeah. get in there and lead committees and, and uh, be part of the um, mechanism for our activities. And at the top of it, uh, even a smaller group of students that are involved, are the ones involved in kind of the governance or policy work, right? So, uh, so we kind of think of engagement from three different perspectives. Um, certainly at the top of that pyramid are the students that are uh, most um, uh, interested in seeing change happen, uh, wanting to uh, have that experience be, uh, their voice be heard very directly, to see the uh, outcome of their work, to be active participants in in the dialogue and the debate, right, and in the decision making. So those are the decision makers. For us at the union, a specific example, that would be our union council, our governing body, right? So, um, so when I think about uh, engagement, I think about it, to what extent are students authentically involved in the decisions that are made? Do they have a voice? Uh, how do we make sure we hear that voice? Um, those types of things. So uh, <clears throat> the next level then are the, um, uh, the students that are really want to be involved in uh, activities and programs at the union. So in a sustainability perspective, it'd be the students that really want to make sure that uh, programs and activities and engagement opportunities are happening. They want to be the ones out there doing the um, um, street work, right? Be seen behind the tables, signing people up, right? Uh, running the programs and the events, uh, um, actually um, generating some of those ideas themselves, uh, finding financial support for their ideas and all those types of things. So um, uh, for us at the union, that'd be the Wisconsin Union Directorate, you know, all the uh, committees and clubs of the union are all student run and student led. Uh, and um, they do currently have, some of those have sustainability uh, initiatives that they wanna do, right? Uh, um, and then also, I guess I should have said, also at the uh, governance level, uh, our governing board last year um, uh, uh, added to our budget, uh, full-time sustainability coordinator. So that's how they saw the, um, their voice uh, be put into action, right, by uh, putting that into our actual operating budget. So, so then, uh, so the governance, the decision makers, the programmers, people doing all the work, uh, and then the broad category that the union thinks about a lot are, and student affairs thinks about a lot is just the student body at large, right? So not every student wants to be uh, in a governance role. Not every student wants to be on a committee or a club or producing programs and activities. But what do we do all that for? We do that for the 45,000 students, right? So, uh, and we want them to show up at events and to engage in activities and to be active on the campus. And, um, and so, um, they're kind of, and they vote with their feet, right? Or not this year with their feet, with their uh, clicking into a video, all right? Or a virtual experience. Uh, uh, and so engagement at, at its heart, I think has to also be about what the broad community is um, 
uh, interested in, right? And uh, what they'll turn up for and what they'll um, um, uh, either um, spend their money on or put their time and energy into. Um, and so uh, those first two can do all the programming and decision-making they want, but if it's not really speaking to the needs of the broad audience, then it's for naught, right? So, so that's kind of how we think about engagement uh, and remind students when we work with them throughout the year um, that uh, there's a role for everybody. Uh, and it's just a matter of how much you want to put into the enterprise. And, uh, but also remembering that uh, uh, you're here to serve everybody, right? And so um, all of those decisions and programs that are put together are for the broad student body. So um, just some thoughts on engagement from a student perspective. That's how we do it kind of on a daily basis. So, so I think I'll turn it over to Chris now. Mm -hmm. He's gonna talk about it from a different perspective. So. Hey, thanks, Mark. Um, I'm gonna make my way to um, external engagement, but before I do, I regret um, just not taking a minute to provide just a little bit of background for those who may not be as familiar with um, the athletic department as others. So we have approximately, give or take, 750 student athletes that belong to uh, at least one of 23 sport programs. Um, and just to go to the starting point here, you know, our mission is to provide opportunity, access to higher education through sport. And um, the result of that is we are able to reach uh, an, uh, a really diverse group of people on all fronts from race, ethnicity, geographic diversity, socioeconomic, um, all benefiting from uh, access to higher ed via sport. Uh, we graduate almost 90% of our student athletes on a year-to-year -year basis. Uh, it's on par with the general student body. Um, and uh, have uh, last year 100% uh, successful career outcomes in placing our graduating student athletes into meaningful uh, opportunities. And that's, that's really been a huge emphasis of ours uh, in the last couple of years uh, to try to um, fill out the kind of life cycle of being a student athlete. That's, that's where we're trying to get to. Um, what I wanted to just talk about today is that uh, this is one facet of our um, operation or our enterprise, and that is um, kind of our external engagement. Um, we have a, a team of people that make uh, community service opportunities available to our student athletes, and you, you may see content that's produced around those. Uh, hundreds of, of community engagement opportunities uh, take place. Um, the one that I, the one area that I thought though may be interesting to this group is our reach um, and and the number of events in, in the events that we produce. Um, because some of these are very high profile and, and you think of, uh, for example, uh, like the athletic events that we produce for these 23 sports. We produce uh, uh, in the 1920 uh, fiscal year, so think of that as pre-pandemic, um, 144 sporting events for our programs. That results or equates to a million two in visitors in attendance. Uh, seven, seven home football games has over a half a million uh, patrons come through Camp Randall. Uh, 17 basketball games, almost 300,000. Hockey, 200,000. It, it all it adds up to a million two people come through our gates. Um, but there are also all these external um, events you could think of as a, a sporting events, that is high school. We would partner with the WIA and produce all these other events, 40 of them in total for another almost 150,000 visitors that are coming to Madison from all parts of the state uh, for, to cheer on high school teams. Um, we produce tailgates, career fairs. Uh, we partner with campus, uh, family fun days, uh, NFL pro days, where we have 32 pro teams coming in to evaluate. Uh, uh, 
diversity kickoffs and luncheons to uh, student org fairs, job fairs. Um, this all adds up to 653 total events with a million five, uh, 1 million 500,000 people coming through the gate at our facilities. Um, and so there's a incredible reach, um, you know, beyond the local uh, attendees of those events all over the state, all over the country and the world, really. Um, but uh, I thought this group might find that interesting. There's an incredible opportunity there as well. Um, and that's why we're excited to be part of this project. Um, last little factoid, um, we just prior to the pandemic released our uh, economic impact study in which uh, we found um, an econ a positive economic impact to the state of Wisconsin of $610 million annually and uh, $395 million to the city of Madison. And so if you think about all of that um, share of wallet, if you will, that someone that's traveling to Madison from out of town um, spreads around town in terms of hotels and restaurants and, and everything else, uh, it's a pretty staggering number. Um, it, it becomes sobering to think about that uh, in a year like we've had in which uh, all that has just uh, abruptly ended, but we'll get back to that. Um, but that's one facet of, of our enterprise that I thought maybe this group would be interested in learning a little bit more about. And, and, um, and I think we'd all agree, view that as an opportunity as we continue our work here. So with that, I'll turn it over to Sarah. Thanks, Chris, and thanks, Mark, um, for teeing that up. So in, in my role as Chief Alumni Engagement Officer for the Foundation and Alumni Association, and I also have the title of Executive Director of the Wisconsin Alumni Association, we're really all one organization. Um, uh, we have uh, our primary constituency is alumni, donors, and to some extent, their, their families, but really alumni and donors. And the, the scope and the reach of the folks that we're working with is around 450,000 to 500,000 people in our, in our database. Um, as I was thinking about our approach um, to how we, how we approach alumni engagement uh, and thinking about what the parallels are possibly to this project, how we can leverage that network, but also how can we apply or how might some of the principles apply to what we're trying to do here? Um, a, a few things occurred to me. So uh, I want to talk just a little bit about uh, what my thought process was when Alex gave us a, a sneak preview of the, the engagement strategies to think about um, and also draw some connections with, with how we might leverage the, the alumni and donor audience in this space. Not dissimilar to Chris and to Mark, um, our team does a series of events every year. We've gone all virtual for the last 10 months. That's shown to be a, a really great benefit in terms of increasing our scope. Primarily, we would just do in-person events in key geographic areas and in Madison, doing about 400 or so a year when we include events that campus sponsored um, and reaching somewhere in the neighborhood of 60,000 alumni, which is a um, not a great proportion for in-person events, but um, the the uh, the what we really would focus on the quality. The emergence of virtual has allowed us to triple, if not quadruple, that number, and so we're really looking forward. To, as we go ahead in our plans to increasing the reach and scope to folks who don't live in one of those geographic areas or don't have time to come to a fixed time in a fixed place um, for, for a particular event. So lots of great opportunities there in this new virtual world. So as we're thinking about engagement at the Foundation Alumni Association, um, we, we really, engagement is sort of our primary purpose in general with this audience. And we have, we are trying to drive affinity, pride, and a sense of community among our constituents. And we are trying to secure support for the university, whether that's financial or volunteer or some sort of um, um, support in, in other ways, advocates, um, mentor, that kind of thing. 
And that is our overarching, that is what we do. Build affinity, secure support. How we do that, and we have six years of data to show by we keep, we do that by keeping our alumni and donors informed about the university and providing opportunities to help them feel connected to the university and to the university mission and what we're doing. And so as I think about sustainability and this project, you could sort of scale that down um, and think about when I'm thinking about alumni, I'm thinking about how can we help build a sense of affinity to this project and this topic and this initiative? And how can we help people feel connected to what the outcomes are? And could this be, could sustainability be another point of connection that would resonate for, for alumni and donors? So we build affinity pride community, we keep, and we do that by um, keeping people informed and connected. When we're making choices about what to inform people about and how we best connect them, very similar to what Mark was saying about decisions he encourages and asks the students to make, we think about what is gonna add value, what will be relevant and um, meaningful to our constituency, right? And how do we meet them where they're at? So I could sit around and think of the greatest idea in the world, but if I'm the only one in the world who thinks it's relevant and um, and it isn't through a channel or using language or inclusive in a way that it's meaningful or or um, inclusive of a broader body. It doesn't really matter. So we we want to make sure that when we're choosing how we're informing and connecting alumni. We are doing it in a way where we're acknowledging how are we meeting them where they are. How are we adding value to their lives and not just make it about us and what we want to do? And then the last part is um, when we're thinking, and I think Mark alluded to this a little bit too in describing the pyramid, um, we are thinking about uh, different degrees of audiences and, and sort of different modalities almost. When I talked with Alex earlier about this, it, it I articulate it as internal and external, but really when we're talking about engagement, I think more accurately it is the people who are engaged in the process and the people who are engaged in the product. So our internal staff, high level volunteers, board, um, in Mark's world, his council and union directorate, they are engaged in the process of figuring out the priorities of making the policies of building the infrastructure and making the decisions. Our alumni and donors and the external audience are really engaged with the product, the, the outputs of what we do. Um, and they're engaging with the information and the opportunities. So in looking at our work here and in the different engagement strategies, I could clearly see ones that were more focused on being engaged with the process of building and ones that were more focused on being engaged with the product and what, what we're offering up. I see an intersection with the alumni constituency mostly in how do we engage them with, the, with what we're going to do, what we're offering up um, and, and getting their affinity to this cause um, with a little bit of alumni involvement, maybe in the in the process part, uh, working through, um, you know, my leadership council and other alumni networks through through our chapters. Um, so I am 100% certain that there is zero wisdom in there, but I just wanted to share kind of my my lens through which I looked at that, and I see uh, a lot of great opportunity to view sustainability in the initiative here as. Um, one way to practice how we engage alumni and donors uh, across the university and in other initiatives. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to share that. Well, thank you. And I think you're all underestimating yourselves. I think there was some nuggets of wisdom in there. So I appreciate it. Um, Natalie, Emma, Michael, would you like to give a, an update from the most recent student subcommittee meeting? Yeah, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm just going to share a couple of points that we discussed at the last student subcommittee before I pass it off to Emma. Um, so first of all, we all come from different backgrounds and experiences 
when terms of you know engaging with sustainability here as our times of student but i think the biggest driver that we noticed was the lack of visibility and awareness about these opportunities um, even specifically about this subcommittee it was really hard for students to find this opportunity and it's hard for them to find research and internship opportunities that we already have. I think UW already has a lot of great opportunities. We just lack um, bringing it to the public eye and you know, general students. So hoping that we can just kind of have some more streamlined communication, that would be a really great help in student engagement with sustainability. Another you know, aspect that came to this was, you know, when we were discussing it, it's hard to be involved when you don't have that level of foundation like a lot of us heard about this opportunity for the sustainability advisory council because we were already involved in some way with sustainability on campus without that you know baseline level of involvement a lot of students didn't even hear about this opportunity i know emma mentioned that a lot of her grad school colleagues didn't hear about this opportunity because they weren't involved with sustainability on campus already or just kind of didn't meet their eyes so we're hoping that you know just simply just to increase the visibility and awareness of them will actually kind of boost our engagement opportunities with sustainability as students. Um, and then the last point that I want to make before I pass it off to Emma is just to see more, you know, support from staff for student sustainability leaders and the organizations that they're a part of in the work in progress. We think if there's more support for us students that are leading this kind of charge in sustainability, that will present more opportunities within itself. Um, so, and then with that, just like more communication through staff and all of these sustainability leaders, there's so many different organizations on campus that work towards sustainability, but there's a lot of lack of communication um, among them. So, you know, sometimes there's clubs that are kind of working on the same thing. It would be great if they were connected together so that they could work through this process together. But oftentimes, you know, we have like a middleman or we're just kind of missing each other. So somehow increasing like a well, you know, centralized hub for communication among everyone when working interested in sustainability on campus, we think that's just an opportunity within itself. So um, I'm going to pass it off to Emma that's going to talk a little bit more on some of the solutions that we talked about. Thank you. So yeah, just to kind of build off of what Natalie was talking about, um, and I think it was Mark that made this point, you kind of have those tiers of engagement. And right now, the student subcommittee mentioned that we think we're definitely losing kind of the least engaged tier right now. And so we want to find ways to be able to bring in people who are not already involved. Because um, those people who are already involved in student leadership and sustainability internships and stuff, they know where to be looking for these kinds of opportunities, but we're missing kind of that bottom layer. So one of the solutions that we came up with was um, just consolidating resources as much as possible so that way if we can draw someone into the website or to a job fair or something like that everything is already laid out for them and they can find everything in one place so it was kind of building off of the sustainability institute um, that we talked about last time but just kind of creating a page on the sustainability website where you have all of the researchers at UW who are doing sustainability specific research or um, student organizations, upcoming events, sustainability internships, jobs, et cetera, et cetera. So that way, if we can bring them in, they don't have to go on this kind of wild goose chase to find one opportunity. It's already all laid out for them there. So that was the, what I had to share. All right, is that it from an update on the subcommittee? Okay, <laughs> excellent. Uh, well, uh, thank you and thank you to everyone for providing that, that great context. Um, the, the last thing uh, that I'm gonna do before we break out into our um, small groups this morning is just do a quick overview of the focus areas, which is what we're going to do a lot of our discussion later this afternoon. Although I think a lot of what we heard this morning will provide good context um, and good thoughts for where, where to take these um, and where we're happy to expand um, on these focus areas. So let me pull that up and share it. Give me one second. Okay. Um, so again, the, the structure for how we set up these, um, these focus areas, um, similar to the academic and research ones, they were developed based on the feedback received at the, the campus listening sessions in October. 
um, the experience of our staff working here on campus, um, feedback from the council, which we'll actually primarily get today <laughs> and, and make additional updates that way, um, as well as the results of our STARS report, our sustainability report, and our gap analysis comparing to our peer schools. So we provided the, the details of this gap analysis document when we sent out the materials on Monday, but just wanted to, to flash this up on the screen to remind everyone that particularly in looking at the star scores, there is a lot of opportunity um, for improvement, um, at least compared to our peers in the areas of, of sustainability engagement. But back to the, the focus areas, I will take just a few minutes and run through kind of the general idea behind all of these quickly so we have at least a common starting place for our discussions today. Um, the first one on our list here, um, which we're in no particular order, um, is uh, uh, kind of leadership and advocacy. So this focus area is about, at least at the institutional level, uh, Madison taking a more direct role in advocating for sustainability related public policy issues and or leading local or regional sustainability policy initiatives. Communications and branding, um, it's really about improving um, internal uh, coordination on developing internally facing and externally facing communications, um, as well as, you know, looking at um, events that can elevate sustainability in the brand and perhaps even the culture um, here uh, at UW-Madison. Slightly different from what we had called out for sustainable events, which is really around policies and requirements for events um, that are held on campus, whether those are internal um, or um, for public audiences, which fingers crossed at some point in the near future, we will be able to have again. Uh, sustainability athletics is around kind of policies and requirements for athletic events um, and activities. And this could be um, football games or intramural volleyball games, kind of the gamut of the way athletics integrates into student and community engagement. Alumni engagement is a little bit of an extension of the communications and branding um, focus area, but really are keyed in on building engagement with alumni and perhaps the opportunities for that to transition and develop into change into development opportunities. Continuing education, um, this focus area is about driving the incorporation of sustainability into continuing education offerings, whether that's through the Division of Continuing Studies, UU Extension, or some of the other continuing education courses offered by other um, schools and colleges. Co-curricular learning, um, this is around kind of organizing and supporting the non-class related learning activities um, that are um, happening all the time in and around campus. Um, so that um, could also include student organizations as well. And then finally, the last one for, for our discussion today um, is um, onboarding and training. And so this is really around the idea of incorporating sustainability um, training and orientation for students, staff, and faculty. Just call out quick here at the end of this document, we did want to acknowledge that a lot of the stuff we talked about last month around academics and research have a very direct um, relation um, to engagement opportunities. And so we highlighted a few here at the end and imagine this will be a common theme as we move forward. There's going to be a lot of overlap um, in the, the different focus areas. Any questions um, um, on um, these or um, anything we've, we've discussed this morning before we transition into our, our group discussions? All right. Well, thank you for bearing with us. Um, I will hand it off here to um, Deb just to introduce the, the group discussions while I start to set up the breakout rooms. Great. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Just to remind everyone, we're basically going to go through the same process we went through the last time. And we will also use this process when we go to forward to the next two pillars. So there should be a little bit of familiarity. Um, what we really are trying to do is, you know, sort of unpack some of these, get a little bit of an understanding, try to get a common understanding where we can around some of these ideas. What are the challenges in trying to uh, implement some of these things? What resources do we have that we can leverage? Anything that's missing? So those are kind of the big questions that we're going to be asking. Um, this again, just to remind you, is not the only opportunity for feedback. We're, we'll circle back to all of these after we review the four pillars. We've got the survey that we're going to send out to get some feedback from you. Um, so we, you know, we're going to continue to do that because we realize the other thing we realize is this is sort of iterative as we learn new things. For example, how some of these connected back to the academics. 
uh, focus areas from last time, um, we may be reevaluating. So um, just to keep those things in mind as we move forward. Any questions before we break out into our small groups? Are you ready to do that, Alex? Are you set? I think so. Give me 30 okay. seconds here and I think you'll all, I'll be all over. All right, see everyone on the other side. It's me Hello. and you, Missy? Yeah, but there should be a lot of us in here. Oh, okay, I only like we see one person. Okay, here oh. we go. Okay. Uh, <laughs> we follow y'all down. Hello. <sighs> All right, so um, I'm just gonna put it out there in the beginning. I was not at the last one, so I'm not as preconditioned as you all are in this process. So bear with me a little bit. Just let me, let me catch up. Wait, Nathan's going to run it. No, just you too. So do you want to just run through the process real quick, Nathan? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So hi, um, everyone again. And welcome back, Cheryl. And uh, thanks for coming, Jake. Um, so uh, I'm Nathan Yandel, work at the Office of Sustainability, Assistant Director, Communications Director, and I'll just be kind of facilitating um, for this uh, chunk of the focus areas, and then we'll switch and you all, actually you all will stay here and the facilitators will, will swap. Um, so we'll basically just do some open conversation here based on uh, a few questions. And um, basically I'll just run through the questions and open it up for conversation. Missy's gonna take notes and um, I will share my screen with the focus areas on it in a moment so that everyone can see that. Um, if people change their mind and feel like what they really want to see are Missy's live notes and we can pick out her typos and other such things, uh, that's also fine too. Um, so basically the, the questions, just to preview them, are, are going to be, and I'm working with two screens here, so if I don't look at you, that's why. Um, which focus areas intrigued or, or excited you of these? And the focus areas are gonna be um, the, the big picture things that Alex talked about. Uh, and then we're gonna talk, ask you guys to reflect a little on what challenges you think we might face in advancing them and what resources um, you or your team or others on campus might be able to bring to, to um, kind of bringing them into being. So let me share, let's make sure this works. Hold on a second. There we go. Share screen. And I'm going to share my Word document. Can you all see that okay? Okay. Is it uh, large enough to read? I tried to like just group the ones we're going to talk about here. All righty. So, um, we're going to start just with your general impressions uh, of these first four focus areas, sustainability, leadership, and advocacy, communications and branding, events, and athletics. Um, and as you can see, if you read kind of across the page, the focus area is what we're ultimately prioritizing, but to help us understand what that entails, we um, wrote some things that we consider the issues that are behind the focus area, some possible initiatives that we might take on in order to address it, and even some more uh, granular action items. So we're most gonna stay um, thinking about the left side of this page, but the entire page is relevant to the conversation. So um, yeah, I'd like to just open it up. Um, what focus areas intrigued or excited you as you look at these, just starting with these four? And you don't need to raise your hand, you can just talk. I can't even see everybody at the same time with my screen, so. Actually, let me see if I can fix that. There we go. Now I can. I feel like I want to jump in, but I'm not really sure. I'm not sure why. Um, but what, looking at the focus areas here, what always intrigues me is uh, coordinated communications. Um, I find that to be um, jumping right away to the challenges. You know, one of the most challenging areas uh, when I heard, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting um, the student uh, rep's name uh, mentioned earlier something re regarding a coordinated approach uh, to communication. I, I uh, 
I think my first reaction was, but what, what does that look like for students? Because I think we feel, you know, sort of reaching an audience almost in any regard. It's like, what platform, what media, what type of message? Um, it, it's real hard to determine how you are reaching and connection, connecting with people that you actually aren't really connected to, to. like they're not the, uh, what, what do you call it? They're not bought in already, right? So you're trying to introduce um, to folks and you don't know how to read them. You don't know how to um, tailor the right message um, using the right medium and the right tone of voice or the right messenger. So th there's a lot there. So I get drawn to that first communication. My, always my sticky point. Well, and I should say that um, the, what you just did there, which was to move immediately into challenges and uh, kind of reflect, that's perfect. Um, okay. So let's just consider this all on the table. If, as you th talk about things you're interested in, what challenges do you think there are in, in implementing them and what are some of the resources we might have? So thanks, thanks, Cheryl. As the communications guy for the Office of Sustainability, I definitely, uh, you know, feel this one. And I think one of the things I would just add to the conversation, not that this is about me talking, but is that uh, it may, it's, I think it's particularly challenging when you're not actually representing a specific major or department, but you're representing a, a concept that you're trying to kind of roll out in a number of different ways across campus. And so, you know, uh, I, I could say, well, we have all these things on the website that the students wanted, or most of them, they just have to find it, but that's, they just have to find it part is a huge, huge um, puzzle, actually. Right. Other thoughts on, on this? Yeah, go ahead, please. I can jump off of that. I, I was also looking at sustainability and communications or in communications and branding. And that's another area that I think is, or that's the area that I think is most important, just because I think as a university on a global scale, we kind of fail at providing the students all, of, I've said this many times, but providing the students all the resources we give them. Like there's so many resources that the university play, pays for and has offered to students, but they're like hidden in websites or in certain programs and stuff. And as students, you have to take the initiative to go and find those types of things. And it's like you're saying the same thing with sustainability, you just have to find them. So I think that's the most important is having a clear and concise way of getting it out to students and having kind of like a spot for sustainability or something like that. But um, I do agree with um, Cheryl in that it's all over the place. Like it's super hard to try to get this in a social media growing environment and with students communicating in different ways it's really hard to get the information all out to all the students. Um, I think that's one of our most important areas because you first have to build a knowledge base around it before you have people who are uh, initiated enough to uh, want to go to events or want to engage in athletics or want to be a part of leadership positions that are doing this. I think um, to Michael's point too, is like what kind of what Emma said in the whole group was like having this centralized hub, right? That has everything, classes, research opportunities, internships, jobs, clubs and organizations all in this consolidated space is gonna be really useful, especially for new incoming students. I remember when I was a freshman, I went to the org fair and I was overwhelmed because there would be a sustainability club here. And then on the like all the way across the Cole Center was another one and there wasn't this consolidated space that I could just go to and see everything you had to really dig and deep and find. Um, so having this consolidated space is gonna be really helpful just to guide students through the process and what the university has to offer. And as I'm looking at it, I see a net, um, one of the example action items is create a network of ambassadors who promote sustainability. I think that's also gonna be really helpful. Uh, I'm gonna go back with my experience. I'm with work with ASM and a lot of the stuff we're doing works with what FH King is doing another student Oregon campus or clean is doing another student Oregon campus. And we lack that communication and connection that would really help us, 
you know, as a whole entire group of students, right? But we lack that just kind of checking in with each other to see what project we're working on. But if we had that communication group, that network, it would be really helpful for students to guide, you know, through what their progress is, what their work is doing, and also just new opportunities within itself because CLEAN might know what, you know, a new like research opportunity is on campus, but I and ASM might not know what that is. So having that group to spread the word would be really helpful as well. I know I was um, drawn to the idea of the uh, annual sustainability forum. Uh, it's also in the same box as a possible, you know, um, whether that, and we have great examples. We have the diversity forum as an example, right? That uh, is now grown to two days. <laughs> One year, we even went into the third shift, I think. It was overnight, practically. So <laughs> I don't know if we did, did you do that? I don't know if you did it. Still do, yeah, okay. We still do it. Um, still do it. We just had to de delay it because of COVID. Yeah, yeah. Um, or another example is the annual showcase that, about process improvement that everybody kind of does their poster sessions about what they've done, that, right? There are examples on the campus around how we uh, dedicate days to these types of things. And so that one really struck me. Um, so, and it could be blended with the sustainable, you know, it could be set up as a, an example of producing a sustainable event as well, right? I mean, it could. Um, can be done in a way that really highlights some cutting edge thinking about how you do events in a sustainable way and practice that through the forum, right? So, and then, so that's the second one I was really drawn to was um, having some campus policies that actually fo force is a strong word, really encourage all the departments to produce their events. In a, like we ought to practice what we preach and just the events we put on every day, right? So um, those types of things, I, I was drawn to that one too. Hmm. I would say that the communications one resonates pretty well because I don't think we do an excellent job letting people know what we're doing. And I wonder if there's some overlap. Um, on this list, it said, you know, have an annual survey about what people know about sustainability. That could be an entry point where you ask, you know, do you want to be added to a mailing list where you get like a monthly or weekly mailer about what we're doing? You know, people could opt in or out, but it'd be a low stakes way for them to say, oh yeah, totally, tell me what's going on. But one idea. Yeah, I think for me, like just looking at these, uh, again, sort of to reiterate some of the comments that have already been made, um, like for me, the inter the interaction, the intersection between communications and branding and events is really resonant with me, uh, partially because you know, my office plans a fair number of events. Uh, like we partner with, uh, you know, with the union quite a bit. Uh, shout out to Mark. Um, but, um, you know, I think, you know, you can talk about communications in a 10,000 foot view, uh, at a 10,000 foot level, but there's also just the sort of like point of pride in the mundane details and that first bullet under events, like require zero waste events. And just like, the knowledge that you are participating in such, I think, increases awareness and increases sort of that as a point of pride for the campus. Um, and I, I certainly don't think that can be underestimated because I know that uh, particularly for the past couple of years, any feedback that I have gotten on events, um, just in terms of the logistics, always involves sustainability and concerns around that. So that, that really resonated with me. Can I, I, I want to hash out a, um, uh, an example of what I'm thinking about when I hear us talking about the communications pieces and building a hub. And I want to liken it to your experience engaging the COVID, the details of COVID hub, the web hub, right? There was at one time one place for you to go for an overwhelming amount of information to the point that I know even myself <laughs> stopped going to that because it was too much, too overwhelming. Uh, is I wanna know what other experiences are. So as we think about like that simplicity or strategy around simplicity consolidation, it makes clear sense. 
until it becomes so overwhelming, it's completely um, not useful. That's one thing. The other thing I'm thinking is what we really are, are we really focused on behavioral changes? And so they're probably more subtle, subtle than reading. It's just kind of like operationalizing things for people and that creates education. Like I heard, like this zero waste event. I learn about that by going and like, oh, this is a zero waste event. What's that about? What does that mean? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I think that would promote significant behavioral change by aligning ourselves, aligning uh, sustainable events with other large scale events to shift behavior and increase awareness. I don't know. I'm just throwing spaghetti right now, but my mind is really racing. But yeah, if y'all wanna go back to that COVID example, cause I feel really overwhelmed and afraid that anything we do to produce c communication would be become so overwhelming so quickly that we won't gain anything. I don't know, just think. How people uh, absorb information these days, especially kind of optional information, I think is is a real trick here because I think Cheryl, you're absolutely right. Um, we, we've we've talked internally quite a bit about sort of how complex to make our website, and we're not the only ones, of course, who have to think about that. And I think the COVID nineteen website is a perfect example, a, a comparison. You know. How much time are people actually going to be willing to spend on a website sort of clicking around? How do you how do you allow them to move quickly through content and also have enough depth of content and also be able to find it and also not have 50 menus with all these submenus, you know? And is it should it be one website? Is it multiple? And if it's multiple, how do you get them to know that there are multiple or, or whatever? So all of those questions I think are really important here. Um, to kind of keep in mind, not that we need to get into the weeds into answering them today, but I think that you you raise a you raise a good point. There there are interesting balance points to try to hit in a number of these. How do you how do you change behavior and educate people while also just making things the only choice they have, right? Creating zero waste events that are required, so there's no other option for the event organizer. But then you can, you know, you can follow through with communications around what you're doing and you can follow through with education, you can follow through with stories about it and so on. Oh, that just made me think about anything else. So I, I don't know what a zero waste event could actually look like, right? Personally, so y'all can educate me. But would there be an individual that would be completely um, I don't know what word I want to use. Marginalized, um, felt vulnerable to being a part of a forced event, a forced experience like that. Is there someone who that, that we would actually do harm uh, to someone by forcing them into a zero waste event? I'm just wondering. There can be accessibility questions, among others. Like you get rid of straws, and then someone with the, who needs a straw in order to drink properly is not going to have that option. Um, and I'm sure there's a whole bunch of others that aren't leaping into my head right now, but I think that's one of the most obvious ones. Mm -hmm. So that's another good question. Yeah. I have a question, I guess, that builds on that. Um, so why is zero waste? Why not like we want to cut our waste by 50% first. Uh, I think that's an interesting question, maybe for Missy to chime in on too. I think we've um, we've committed to trying to achieve zero waste on campus, which means a 90% or greater diversion from the landfill. So it's not actually zero anyway. Uh, and it's an interesting question even if you decided to keep it at that 90% or greater, whether you should be communicating that as opposed to zero waste since it's not zero. And that that always sounds to me a little bit like an unachievable goal because most of the time it is. Um, although I should say that our, our green events intern team has managed to get some pretty good sized uh, events to, I can't remember what they got, like 96% diversion or something like that. 
but it takes a lot of work, a lot of planning, a lot of coordination, and literally people standing by waste bins to help, um, you know, direct folks into using the right one. But I think it's an interesting question, Andrea. There, there are other ways to approach this. Yeah, and I mean, I guess the question too is, what do you define it as waste? Because there's a lot of plastics recycling data right now, right now that says it's not worth it. Mm -hmm. So it's all being thrown in a landfill. So if we push it to like, we should recycle all the plastic, but they get thrown in a landfill downstream. I, I just think we might need to be careful about zero waste events and what is waste. I mean, you could have 96% landfill diversion if you threw it all in an incinerator. But is that what you want? I don't know. You might want to talk more about what zero waste is another day. Sure. Yeah. I might fold in well the operations. And we do have a zero waste team on campus. Um, I'm going to bring us back out at the, the 10 to 20,000 foot level. Um, and I thought, Cheryl, you brought up a really good point. And one of the we about the consolidation in one space, right? What we really want is a culture shift. And we actually use diversity, equity, and inclusion as that, right? It's everywhere. You don't have to go to one place. Um, and, and people do it without even recognizing it. You know, what we end up doing is calling out when you're not doing it. Um, and that's where we want to get to. And I, I, so I actually, one of the reasons I really wanted you on this advisory council is to bring that perspective. And, and I know it's taken decades, if not centuries to get there. So, um, but since you've already been, you know, still working through it, maybe you can help us accelerate some of these strategies. Uh, I'm happy to say, you know, talk about roadblocks uh, I'm familiar with facing, which is why I create some of those questions like, is someone harmed by mm -hmm. moving in a particular direction? And that's the way we need to begin the process decision making in the first place. Who's left out? Who's harmed? What is that experience going to be like for all? Um, where do people have choice as opposed to force? Um, but yeah, thank you. Ha happy to be here and work it all out because I'm going to learn a whole lot. Andrew, you asked some su such great questions. I, I want every answer that you get. I, I want it because <laughs> that is, uh, that, this is learning for me. So uh, we've got about five minutes, four minutes left before we're going to get um, moved to our next groups. But I'm, I'm curious whether not I, it's clear that the, the focus right now and the interest is in communications and branding and to some extent sustainable events. I'm curious what you all think about the other two focus areas, maybe particularly the first one, leadership and advocacy, um, since, just since we haven't talked about them yet uh, or at much length. In some ways, I wanna pose it as a question. To what extent do you think that UW-Madison should take a greater interest and role at, institutionally in leading on sustainability in leading collaboration, uh, in fostering advocacy and so forth. Yeah, my thoughts on that one are, um, uh, I, I think it'd be a source of pride for the UW community if uh, UW-Madison was seen as uh, a leader in that. I don't know enough about what it takes to do that. And that seems like that's an area of expertise for people like the Office of Sustainability <laughs> to, right? So, and it's probably an issue of, um, you know, do we aspire to, you know, um, uh, have sustainability be, you know, number two or three on the list of things that UW Madison is known for? You know, you, you think of global health initiatives and things like that right away when you think about UW Madison. But um, so I, I know I, picked up some of that from uh, our um, initiation session that we went through with um, Lieutenant Governor Barnes and so forth being there and reminding us about uh, you know the position that uh, UW-Madison has had in sustainability across time and to reclaim that kind of historic uh, status, things like um, um, Earth Day and so forth, right? So um, Gaylord Nelson and so forth. So. Um, so I think, yeah, I think that'd be a source of pride for most of the community, if that were true. I don't know that, I feel like the responsibility for that falls somewhere near the top of the chart, I guess, as opposed to, I don't know. 
I'd also like to jump in. Um, I had the opportunity, one of the example action items is to be a part of the Midwest Climate Summit. And from the student perspective, I think it's it was a fantastic journey. I met one of my best friends that we're continuing to working on still. I got to meet a network of students all across the country that are working towards, you know, making their campus more sustainable. And it really utilized as a resource. So when I tried to do a project, I reached out to them and had shared them their experiences with trying to do it, for example, paper towel composting. And then they reached back out to me and said, what did UW-Madison do for this? Or have you tried this? Um, and a lot of the times they were shocked at the resources that we have that they don't have at their school and just kind of working together as this united front of students. Um, and I think the more examples and opportunities we have for that is a great example for students to get more involved with sustainability on campus and be a part of this kind of forefront. Um, so that's my experience and I would love that. These are really great. Any other thoughts? And we can obviously go back to the other two as well if people still uh, want to process those more because they're really, I mean, ultimately yeah, we're going to have to pick some of these. <laughs> yeah, I'm surprised we don't talk about athletics uh, just because of the type, the culture of our institution and therefore the absolute opportunity. Um, athletic uh, events are um, definitely places to uh, how do I say, um, like manipulate behavior, I guess, you know, get everybody to sing Sweet Caroline, right? So what's the new song? You know what I mean? Like there's such a great opportunity um, to infuse sustainability in athletics in terms of the culture and what we do before events, during events, after events. Um, so I just wanted to put it out there. Uh, not to let athletics fall by the wayside. There's big opportunities there and to impact thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people in one space. There's commercials, there's bottles and cans and cups. And After the transition, yeah. Oh, we lost Dad. We're back in the main we room. We all just got see? swapped. Oh, okay. New breakouts. Oh my God. Oh, hi. Well, Hello. Hi. To close out, I'll just close out the, um, a, another thought on should the office, should the staff do a sequencing or should, should this group? And I think, you know, maybe once we go through these exercises and we see the scores and the prioritization stuff may surface that says, okay, it's clear that we're going to that these five things are our priorities. And then from there, looking at what, in order to do these priorities, what needs to be in place. So it might be a little bit of prioritization, a little bit of sequencing, but I do think the office is probably in the best position to know all of that. Um, so. Sorry. Don't apologize. We were kind of finishing up a point two when we got got launched into this next Rudely one. Rudely yanked away. Rudely, I yeah. know. Well, good to see you all. Um, I'm Nathan again, and I'll be facilitating these focus areas. I hope you had a good conversation in the last one. Um, and I think what we'll do is start by quickly giving you an overview of what the previous group said so that you can have that in mind to potentially respond to it. Missy, uh, I don't know how you feel about this, but instead of actually showing your notes, which will be a little hard to kind of skim and track, I'm thinking you and I could just um, do our best to give a two minute uh, overview of what people focused on. Uh, and in the meantime, I will share my screen, which is this Word document. So, um, um, oh, you're bringing up the focus areas. Yeah, but go, go for it. So um, focus areas for this discussion are leadership and advocacy, communications and branding, events and athletics. So the first group got spent quite a bit of time on communications and branding as a priority and really talked a lot about how difficult it is to find and make connections for people that have similar affiliations and are you know, basically doing the same work in, in alignment. 
Um, so then we started talking about a sustainability hub or where everything's in place. And then we got talking about how confusing that is. So if you look at COVID as the example, the COVID website is completely overwhelming and people actually stopped going to it because it was so confusing. Um, and then we started talking about, well, really what we're looking for is what diversity, equity, and inclusion has, right? Everyone owns it as part of our culture. And what we notice is when it doesn't exist. And that, so we we're talking um, a little bit about that. Chris, I'm sorry, we didn't get to athletics till the very end and then we just got flipped. So we're, <laughs> we're a little light um, on that. So we're hoping we could um, fill that out a little bit more. Um, anything I missed, Nathan? Uh, no, I don't think so. I, I think, um, yeah, there, there was some discussion about kind of balancing uh, making sure we get out information to people and then not also not overwhelming them, them with information. That was part of the, the point about the COVID-19 website is that for a while, um, one of the members said it was incredibly useful. And then at a certain point, she kind of stopped visiting because she felt like there was just too much there. It was too much to track and follow. It wasn't even necessarily that it was a poorly designed website. It's just there's physically almost too much, like, you know, picking up a giant book. Um, and, you know, to the, the students in particular, we're pointing out that they, you know, if you're already involved in sustainability, you're going to know about your opportunities. If you're not, you're not. Um, and even amongst and within sustainability organizations and so on on campus, there isn't a ton of coordination. I think that's, that's editorial here. I think that's changing a little bit, but not very quickly. Uh, and so it's not always clear how everyone could be working better together. Um, and there is a fair amount of conversation about sustainable events and what, what would they look like and, um, this whole concept of zero waste came up a bit too. So those were the previous groups, FOSI, and I'm going to just throw it out to you all. You know how these things run. Um, really interested in your impressions, um, the, the focus areas that jumped out to you most of, amongst the, these, uh, these four here, leadership advocacy, communications, branding events, and athletics. Um, and then as we talk about it, considering things like what are challenges or, or roadblocks that are gonna get in our way of implementing these things? And what are some of the resources on campus that we might have that we could leverage? So it seems like you all were chatting along quite adequately before. So I'm just gonna shut up and let you start talking and I'll try to help facilitate as best I can. Since you guys didn't touch upon athletics last time, I think we should give Chris a first chance to add to his perspectives. I'm sure he's, I, I can see him thinking a lot about his, <laughs> his gears are returning there. It's the last thing I think of before I close my eyes at night and the first thing I, I do when I open them in the morning. <laughs> that, that means we're really <laughs> successful. Thank you. <laughs> um, well, I, so uh, just a little commentary on that athletics in general. I, obviously, you know, where we started today's call is a huge opportunity given that just the sheer numbers and visibility of our reach, um, both in our events and our platforms and beyond. Uh, we've got student athletes that are passionate about sustainability and, um, and it seems with each year, uh, more and more of them um, that kind of tear down any kind of stereotype that you might imagine. Um, you know, it goes, it's just, it's a reality. What, what one thing for us that uh, is different this year than in the past is uh, that, that could make things more difficult for us is budget. Uh, we've been just by nature of what we do, um, one of the hardest hit uh, on campus uh, in terms of resources and uh, we've had to let go of people and, and scale back and it's been a really, really tough year. So uh, we're not in the position financially that we were in a year ago. So um, that isn't to say that um, there aren't things that we can do, but um, we will have to be far more budget minded than we have in the past when we approach those. Um, and I do think there are all kinds of ideas that have minimal uh, budget impact, if any, that can that can make a difference. So uh, that's just generally speaking, uh, 
the 30,000 foot view on this from athletics perspective. I'm interested in hearing thoughts from others um, on some of those ideas. You know, just, just a thought, Chris, my background always leads me back to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And, um, you know, when I, when I think about you and, and other colleagues in athletics, all of us, all of us, maybe we're at a higher point on Maslow where we're approaching self-actualization, we're really able to do and develop and be at such a, a high transformative level. And, and this pandemic and, and the financial constraints and all of the things part of it plunged all of us down to just sort of that very basic level of how do we survive? What do we do? How do we rebuild? And I can appreciate the, the capacity this might just be more of a general statement about overall challenges and kind of how Alex started our meeting, the, the bandwidth, the capacity, the energy, the resource needed to simply figure out how are we gonna survive? How are we gonna rebuild? How are we gonna do our work in a new reality? We may be in a place where we have to put all our energy to that and sustainability may feel like something that's higher on Maslow's hierarchy. I think one of the goals is ultimately to have sustainability feel like it's as core to the bottom of the hierarchy, but but it may, given the timing, take some time to rebuild the essentials to be able to accommodate that. That's just an observation, not just for athletics, but I think for, you know, I think about my world as well. For sure. I mean, that's just the reality, Sarah. That's a, that's a good way to frame it up. I mean, you know, I mean, we, and we're not alone in this. I know there are other, um, you know, Places around campus that have been hit like us, but I mean, we're in survival mode right now. Yeah, right? not as hard as you've been hit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, again, that's not to close out, you know, open-mindedness to things that can be done. It's just, it's just a, it's a brutal reality. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, I, I, I Sarah, I think it was well said. In fact, I had a very similar circle that I had used to make some presentations years ago. Uh, the sustainability is typically the very last thing that comes to people's mind after the, everything else is taken care of. It's a question of, can I continue living like this, right? Mm -hmm. Now COVID is like, as you mentioned, you know, it's just take a pull the blanket from under us. And as a community, it says, okay, you know what? All of this is well and good, but ultimately the virus can just come and you know, knock everything else, all of us down. And I think it is a good opportunity for us to think about how we want to rebuild. And uh, I think it, there are various, various layers in there. And so it, it appears extremely complex, but I think there is an opportunity for us to sort of peel this off one by mm -hmm. one uh, with small goals uh, mm -hmm. uh, to, to help us move forward. And I was listening to another presentation from uh, Baskin Hill yesterday. That's like, you know, climate change is maybe the last item. The first item may be COVID. The second is economic recovery. And the third one is sort of equity among people. And then we get to climate change, but they're all sort of interconnected. Yeah. Well, and it could be as Gary, you're, but you pointed out so well, I think that's a consideration as, as we are thinking about what the communication and branding will be for sustainability and how we're acknowledging where we're at, it also could be a great opportunity to start as we're rebuilding, building it into the fabric of the culture and how we want to, how we want to rebuild as a campus and where are the opportunities to insert sustainability right now in the rebuild stage too. Yeah, I want to see when, when fall comes, when uh, Bucky is out there, I want some green jacket he's wearing. Right? <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I, you know, uh, something you said, uh, though, I mean, there's opportunity in this. We'll be in rebuilding mode for years to come yeah. to get back to where we were. But, you know, I could see, um, you know, one of the guiding principles um, that will help us get there is, you know, this idea of doing more with less. Uh, clearly, we're going to have less resource than we did in the past, and that, um, I mean, that's a principle that that's an umbrella over uh, all 
many aspects of our operation. Sustainability could be could play a role in that. Uh, it could, you know, again, if we try to try to if we try to build some traction uh, on the front end, that's there's a place for that, and, and that, mm -hmm. it, it fits nicely. It, it aligns with yeah. the overall objective of the of in this case our athletic. I think we're about to get cut off here in a minute, um, but I, I really appreciate what you all are saying. Um, and I, I think remembering that sustainability doesn't have to be an add-on, but can actually be a kind of structuring element of, of everything we do. Um, and that doesn't have to be called sustainability. It can be called things like efficiency. It can be called things called like intelligent design and so on. Is super important, uh, not merely for communications, but for the way that we think as members of the campus community. Um, so that it doesn't become like an, an, an added cost. It's actually a way of avoiding cost, for example. That will depend, of course, on what you're talking about. But, but I'm, I'm glad you guys are working at this level. I think it's really important. Thank you. I think we're going to get jumped in a moment. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Sorry. <laughs> Hello, everyone. So um, I just, as a reminder, I put the document uh, up on the screen. We're going to be focusing on alumni engagement, continuing education, sustainability, co-curricular learning, and sustainability onboarding and training. Um, just to kind of orient us to where we are. And uh, we'll get started. Um, just, you know, as you look through these over, take a minute to kind of get oriented to it. What sorts of things jump out at you in terms of challenges we might face? Uh, let's start with alumni engagement. And if you might think of resources, I mean, our brains don't work quite that in quite that linear fashion. So either one of those that might come up for you, challenges that we face or resources we might leverage for alumni engagement. I'm not gonna hold you to just one specific piece because you thought of something. Um, I'm happy to share some thoughts and, but I'm certainly not the only one who can speak to this room right. or to this room. Um, you know, the uh, probably the biggest challenge in this space of engaging alumni um, is simple awareness. And it's a little bit, um, uh, what we were talking about when we we're talking about the students is just complete lack of awareness about what does the university really mean when we're talking about sustainability? What does that look like um, in terms of very tangible, relatable actions? What benefits and outcomes are happening as a result of sustainability? Um, and, and why is it relevant? to alumni. So I, I think um, there's both a challenge and an opportunity with alumni engagement that fundamentally needs to start with um, information, communication, and very clear articulation of what are we trying to do and how does that benefit the university and the world? Thanks, Sarah. Some of these channels and tactics that are identified certainly could be ways to do that. But I think before we are able to move people to further action on sustainability as ambassadors or advocates or champions or donors, that really important piece of the work needs to be done. Yeah, awareness, got it, that makes sense. I would also add to that um, the importance of uh, personalizing it to the, the alumni per individual themselves and, and not only how it impacts the university and the world, but what does it mean for that individual and their day-to-day -day life? Um, so that if they can buy in on that personal level, then maybe there's a little bit more um, engagement on a community level as well. Alex, that's an excellent point. Thanks, Alex. Anything anyone else wanna add? Any, about resor anything about resources that we might leverage? I can um, speak a little bit on this. So first is that what does sustainability mean? I think uh, 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 Sarah touched upon a very important thing and it means different things for different people. 
and I think Alex was pointing that out, for a business person having a cash flow that, that comes every year, that's what a sustainable business model is. And for somebody who thinks about environmental sustainability, okay, I want to recycle everything. For somebody who is sort of very deep green ecological activist, they say, I want to minimize the consumption. So I, I think there are b several bins and what it means, uh, what sustainability means to different people is different. So uh, we have to have a very, very clear understanding of how we message what we're trying to do uh, in different layers. Uh, one is a day-to-day -day life layer, university operations layer, student operations layer, athletic events type layer. So there's so many different layers in there. And today in the 21st century, I mean, as we're seeing in all these things that are going on, most of the communications that come to us are being pushed. People are learning what type of music we're listening and telling us what we have to listen to. People are looking at what news items we are clicking in and then they push us to different things that we come across. So everybody is in these small echo chambers that sort of uh, reinforce their own ideas. So you know, whatever messages, messaging we do and big picture things that we're trying to do, we have to come to the 21st century. I'm not sure the university operations, I know there are some Facebook initiatives and this and that going on, but we have to move to the 21st century in our engagement uh, through uh, online meetings and whatever we do, I think that's an important challenge and it requires, a, I would say reboot of, uh, uh, of, uh, of how we uh, reach, to the, reach out to the people and, uh, and what type of messaging we want. And what, I mean, I think, I think uh, uh, from the alumni perspective, say like, you know, the development opportunities, what to ask is, uh, how do we express that? Again, uh, the other opportunity in terms of athletic people, I think Chris pointed out really well uh, with the, with the uh, uh, maybe I'll, I'll stick to that alumni right now. We'll talk about the other one later, sorry. Okay. If I could just add a, a point or two, I think that's a great point. And just to steal a, a line that Sarah used, I mean, there, the sheer number of alumni are both a challenge and an opportunity. And if you can accept, if we can try to try to, um, if we can agree that you know, perfect is the enemy of good. How do we attract a segment of the alumni that are passionate about this and build momentum over over a long time? Um, we'll have the same challenge when we get to athletics of these you know, million five people that come through the door, they're passionate, some are gonna be more passionate about this than others. And um, so how do, we, how do we attract the segment of the, in this case, the alumni base that want to be engaged about this and that can be put to work to attract more and to build some, some traction around this? Sounds good. So we really have to be aware of how this is gonna hook people in a way, right? Get their attention based on what's important to them. Any other thoughts about this one? Anything about, oh, go ahead, Sarah, sorry. I was just gonna say, um, Chris, that's a great point and somewhat related to resources in that, you know, we find our best success um, for most of what we do, not trying to capture the entire ocean of alumni, but trying to find the schools of fish. Um, so, so how we do that, and, and Deb, this, this is perhaps a resource to call out or to name is how are we mining our alumni data in such a way that we could, we could make some good guesses about people. Um, we've got some good interest survey data. It, we don't necessarily ask specifically about sustainability, but I think we could do some intersections with demographics and interest areas that at, at least for a resource could be alumni data and how we're gonna segment it and use it for um, at the most likely audience right out of the gate. Yeah, so who are the so-called green badgers as opposed to the red badgers, you know? Uh, how do we identify them? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, the great. One last, 
Oh, I was just going to add one more point about um, as far as uh, like any infrastructure or operational initiatives that we, we may be pursuing. I think a potential challenge with alumni, especially donors, can be the, the cost of implementing those things and making sure that they understand that while the goal of a lot of those initiatives is to save the university money over time, that at times there is a huge startup cost to get those initiatives up and running. And so I think being transparent uh, in that storytelling with alumni and, and what money is going to and the long-term effect is a challenging story to tell, but I think that, um, you know, just talking to some of our peer institutions, that is a lesson learned that, that that's really necessary information to have available upfront. Thank you. Anything else anyone want to say about alumni engagement? I want to make sure we have time to cover the other three areas. Okay, how about if we move on to continuing education, if you want to take a minute to kind of shift gears and start commenting on that. I think in a more immediate sense, uh, we're able to deliver courses uh, that are through, uh, uh, we're, we're learning how to teach through at distance very easily. So connected with alumni or people that we don't typically reach continuing education, we have a great infrastructure uh, that we have. We could start doing sustainability force uh, focused programming uh, among our, through the continuing education programs, not only in state, uh, but outstate globally as well as uh, uh, nationally. Uh, and I think it's a great opportunity that's waiting in front of us that can also potentially bring revenue streams because the, the uh, like even uh, Sarah mentioned, what is sustainability? There's a lot of uh, uh, unknown. People just hear the word and they're scared. Does that mean that I have to go and live in the cabin all the time? Uh, and, uh, and uh, with no running water and no uh, no electricity. So that's not what it is. So I think there's a, a no, enormous opportunity for us to uh, reach, um, uh, you know, through libraries, through high school, high school uh, teaching librarians, teaching high school, offering programs of high school teachers, elementary school teachers, uh, through again, you know, faith-based networks, uh, 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 and uh, I know those are things that are uh, people typically get uh, scared about, but uh, you know there is no reason why we can't have programming uh, that's offered through uh, faith-based networks. Uh, as long as we, our focus, what we're talking about, is uh, related to the you know apple pie and uh, and our 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 our, our common our shared goal of uh, as a, as a humanity, we have to reach across the spectrum, not just uh, uh, only the uh, sort of the usual suspects. Uh, how do we grow this uh, beyond where we typically look for and continuing education is a great way for us to reach uh, across uh, the spectrum. Anything else anyone want to say about continuing education? Yeah, I was just going to mention um, the accessibility and equity in, uh, in accessibility to those programs and, and how do we manage costs of participation, any barriers, barriers of participation um, so that we're not just making those resources available to, to folks who have the financial means to, to participate or, or however that works um, in transparency. I'm not exactly sure how it currently is set up, but noting that this is important information for everyone to have access to regardless of socioeconomic status. Very good. Other thoughts? I think it's a great point from Alex. Make sure that uh, we're going to balance the dollars there. Yeah. yeah. Okay, let's, uh, watching the time, um, want to make sure that we get everything covered here. What about sustainability and co-curricular learning? And so things do we, what are the challenges there and what might we leverage to address those? Is 
it seems that maybe some of the challenges are related to, uh, unless I'm misreading this, um, some of the things that we addressed last time um, with uh, with academic strategies, and I and I wonder if uh, resolving some of those could then intersect could set this up in in engagement um, pretty effectively. I don't mean to abdicate, but it that's where there seems to be a really tight intersection between those academic um, priorities too. Yeah, yeah. I think that's one that we um, identified too when we put, when we were putting this together for you all that there that was one place where we had some of that intersection. I think there's a programming available for student orgs for them to uh, incorporate the sustainably focused themed events within their own mission of what their main interests are would be really good for us to uh, develop. Uh, and I think uh, and, uh, uh, Natalie also mentioned that in the, uh, from, the from an organizational perspective, how uh, they have to reach beyond the um, so the ecological groups and whoever it is. And I think uh, the other part, part that I sort of came to my mind is the Greeks. Uh, are there opportunities for us to uh, do programming, uh, co-curricular type of stuff that uh, the Greek community uh, on campus can be engaged in that? And they also have very strong, their own individual alumni uh, networks as well. Uh, that can be a pathway that we can add to uh, some of these things because they have programming as well uh, as they bring rush people in, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm also wondering, as we talked about, um, when they talked about the tiers for the student learning, that governing group at the top, if there's a way to leverage that group to move those other sorts of activities that aren't ecologically focused as a way to get them into that. I, you know, into that thinking about how their work impacts sustainability. Yeah, and I believe they, our, our guest speaker uh, two meetings ago from Illinois also mentioned how uh, their student orgs uh, all are getting a, like a green sticker or something like that. Yeah. Uh, yes, the sort of incentive programs for them to get grants for their own programming. If they add a green uh, zero waste type of event, they can get an extra whatever. Mm -hmm. um, what yeah, the they're the green badgers, right? That's, that's right. I, I love that idea of green badgers. That sounds like there's some potential there for some sort of marketing plan. Yeah. <laughs> Anything else about the sustainable, sustainability co-curricular? Yeah, I was thinking about something, um, just like a challenge that I've I noticed from the student subcommittee, but also at my old institution was just like stability and continuing leadership among students. Like when you're looking at um, like that top tier, super involved group trying to reach down. Um, inherently students are only here for four years to if they're graduate students sometimes. Um, and so it tends to be that there's one student who's kind of carrying the torch for each organization and then they graduate and then it takes a couple years for it to build back up and the whole cycle continues. So we were discussing how advisors might play a role into that because a lot of student organization advisors, um, they're there to sign off on paperwork and not much else, but like kind of fostering um, mm -hmm. a better relationship from like the office down or the university down of like training uh, student leaders more proactively. Yeah. Other thoughts? We didn't want to leave staff out. So uh, we talked a little bit about, we were thinking about this um, sustainability onboarding and training. What might be some of the challenges or barriers there and what might be leverage uh, to bring sustainability thinking to the folks that work on campus. I think one of the things you want to be careful is not add one more workshop. They sit in and uh, take a little click the button survey. Uh, I think maybe just sort of, uh, I don't know. I, I think this sort of a walking tour type of stuff and uh, the Wisconsin idea tour that we have for faculty 
uh, or some sort of an active programming uh, as opposed to a workshop and clicking a, uh, ticking a box is uh, something uh, uh, that another one is the uh, incentivizing uh, if they uh, I know staff even in uh, facility services and stuff I know many companies they think about well if you have an idea of how we can improve the sustainability uh, and then you get a bonus point or you get written up and uh, uh, some sort of a, a, even a hotline to say hey we're doing something uh, if you have a way of doing something better uh, maybe that reduces the paper consumption or just small, some, some of the things can be small, some of the things can be at large level, you know, turn the thermostat down, down when you go out, turn the lights off when you go out, all of these things, uh, little small things, but they can add up and, uh, uh, and uh, may, taking pledges, you know, um, the, the services people crew that come to the buildings, they watch which rooms are all, uh, Turn, lights turned off and they keep note of it they make part they they are participating in this process now and uh, different floors have competitions on energy consumption uh -huh. uh, things like that we can get uh, 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 engagement uh, you know water use in, uh, in, in in dorms i think that has been uh, discussed earlier at, at other campuses that i've heard about um Parking lot lighting, all kind of things. You know, I'm on a salt use. Uh, there are probably a lot of ideas that uh, our our staff have, and uh, having workshop where their voice is heard uh, can can really help. I think. Yeah, just gotta ask them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Good point. Anything else about sustainability onboarding and training? I would just add a a couple of thoughts. I thought, you know, incentivizing, as was mentioned, is a paramount. Um, and if I think about it in our own, in our department, um, you know, when we bring in people, we have opportunities for orientations and, and onboarding, but really, well, I think what would make those effective uh, on the topic of sustainability is if, if we could do a better job of pointing to what we have going here, what we, a healthy incentivized culture. Um, because I, I question or I wonder how effective um, we'll be at moving the needle if, if we're, I think it has to come from within the organization and, and we are attracting people to work with us on our teams that, that you know, believe this is important rather than the other way around, creating momentum mm. through the onboarding of new people. Obviously, there's a there's a place for new ideas and new perspectives. It goes without saying, but the the unit itself um, has to have some form of uh, some some momentum behind what they're doing to get to get new employees to buy into it. Mm -hmm. This is important. So not like they are. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to just by saying this is important. Th this is what we think is important here in this in this unit, and that's a that's a lot of carrot and not a lot of stick. And yes, following up on that, and I don't mean to be a one note hitting a one note, but for me, it goes back to really clear articulation of what we're trying to do and translating that into really specific strategies that people can wrap their heads around. So Gary, I really appreciated what you just said about, you know, are we this year, are we all about energy consumption or are we all about recycling or are we all about, um, you know, what does some other element that then you can build once you have identified kind of that strategy tactic you build that piece into orientation because if you just build sort of this general we're about sustainability i just think people aren't going to grasp it until it's real to them and it's really clear we're in a competition all across campus about you know who can can drop their electricity usage by the most or you know some very very specific strategies that roll back up into a larger whole. Yeah. Yeah, I was gonna I was gonna say
say that exact same thing. I think Chris and Sarah both made amazing points. I, I think those are really, really good insights. And I think that, um, like, how do we normalize these behaviors and make them highly visible? That this is just part of what we do and who we are. And it becomes part of the expectation. And I, I think, Chris, your point about attracting people who are already bought in and or who are just willing to jump right in, um, you know, that, that if we just have, whether it's signage or the, the, the systems in place support the behaviors that we're willing, that we want to see, I feel like that in itself is a great training. And if you come on campus for an interview or a tour, you're exposed to, oh, this is the kind of campus that Madison is. This is the culture that they celebrate. You know, I think that's a, in some ways could be a stronger message than a slide or a breakout session at SOAR or whatever that might be. You know, it's kind of living those values and living them like very high hey. visibility. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I get it. Okay, we have a, about a minute left. Is there anything that we're missing? Any focus areas that we're missing? We've got a lot here. But I just want to make sure somebody had something burning that we didn't lose it. My observation to Alex pre previously was I was blown away by the, the number of focus areas and thinking that maybe one opportunity is to sequence, not even, pri I mean, there's prioritization, but there may also be value in sequencing them of this has to happen before this to help chunk it down into more digestible bites. Okay, thanks, Sarah. Yeah, in fact, I had uh, given that in the, in the, I had given that feedback in the survey as well. Uh, think about it in a tiered way uh, to help us uh, uh, it's not one is more important than the other. It's like sequencing them so that we can uh, we can view how to get where we need to get. And I think, yeah, yeah. Is that something you're thinking the folks in the sustainability office would do, or is that something you would think the committee would do? I would think because you're collecting all of this, you would start it and then we'll we'll comment on it. Okay. <laughs> That's hard work. Uh, yeah. It's hard for us to do as a, particularly with these virtual stuff. I mean, you're all, I don't know how you're all working together uh, <laughs> uh, in, in this type of stuff. And I, I know I'm working with my grad students and undergraduate students and doing labs, but we're all, I mean, I would say we should all celebrate what we're doing and we're preparing for. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> there we go. Um, this session will be a little bit shorter. Uh, we're going to start with a little bit of a summary of what was already discussed, so we don't necessarily have to repeat. Um, we had, I think, a pretty robust conversation about all of these things. Um, some things around alumni engagement that were some of the challenges. It's just building simple awareness, uh, not always easy to do. You want to be able to target people and get them, you know, give them a message that will resonate with them. Um, so there'll be a challenge in that. Um, if there's a way to personalize messages to the alumni, we probably would be more successful. Um, being aware that sustainability means different things to different people. So how do we define that? How do we, people under, how do we help people understand that? Um, things that we can do to, um, oh, uh, and just the sheer number of alums that we have is a challenge and an opportunity. So we, we wanna make sure that we don't make perfect the enemy of the good and that we figure out how to attract different people that want to be engaged in this. And some of the opportunities to do that are to mine the alumni data that we have and figure out how to segment them. So uh, they have a, a lot of information about alums and just figuring out how to use that to really target those messages to the people that are gonna be most likely to be engaged. Um, and then a question was raised, like we, we, we wanna find out who are the green badgers? So it seems like there might be some sort of a marketing idea in that in that question, who are the green badgers? Um, is there anything anyone want to, might want to add around this idea, this alumni engagement session now that, or section now that I've given you sort of the summary, anything that you either want that jumps out at you that you want to reinforce or a thought that came to you that you want to add? So just to clarify, are we moving to the second like four or five 
categories. Oh, yes. Sorry, Mark. Yes, we're doing <laughs> the ones you didn't do. We're doing the ones we didn't do. Okay. Right. All right. All right. So the other group talked about these. This is what they had to say. Um, and then what might you want to add to them? Yeah. And I think when we moved, I lost my screen sharing. So let me pop that back up just in case anyone wants to refresh your memory about the alumni engagement. I can jump in. I definitely want to reinforce um, what you're talking about with like communication with alumni and providing, especially providing that like individualized one that you were talking about to um, build opportunities for students. So when we're talking about like, these are alumni, these are people who are out there working, doing real life jobs in, and I'm sure there's a plenty of them doing jobs in sustainability, utilizing those resources that mm -hmm. I'm sure some of them have internships or ways that students can be involved in their work. I'm sure they're working in nonprofits. So there's different ways of bringing that information back. And um, well, we were talking about the um, communications and branding, but kind of tying in with that and the academic stuff that we talked about in previous sessions and kind of bringing this, having a space for students to connect with these alumni who are um, passionate about sustainability, who are working in it, um, and who have the capacity to connect with these students. So I think that's an opportunity there. I know that all sounds like a crazy, stupid amount of work, but that's what I see, the kind of um, beautiful vision I have. Okay, no, I think that's that's connecting alums who are working in sustainability. All right, other thoughts that uh, you might want to add to this list? With into my note taker. But... Oh, there it is. All right, then we'll move on to, we don't have as much time with this group. So I'm just gonna move us along here for continuing education. Um, some of the things we said is we have to reach across the spectrum, not just the usual suspects. So um, how does sustainability fit into, I mean, there are places where it's obvious if it's a class about the environment, but how might sustainability weave its way through other types of uh, continuing education opportunities to start to think about that? Um, how can we address barriers to participation in continuing education? So uh, we wanna make sure that there is that people who might not, you know, that the, the, depending on their socioeconomic status may or may not be able to participate. How can we remove those barriers so that we can have people participate uh, regardless of that uh, income position? And then one of the benefits we said that we have is that we have, an in, we have a pretty good infrastructure for continuing education already that we should be able to develop much more meaningful ways to connect virtually. Um, we, you know, had a lot of experience with that over, uh, almost the last year now. Um, so those are some of the benefits that people or the you know, points of leverage that we have for this area. So other thoughts about continuing education. You can see it's the second one too. on the sheet there. Go ahead. Uh, I might also add in um, um, like adult education, I guess. Um, sometimes when I think of People think of continuing education, they think of it as, um, uh, or they could possibly think of it as, uh, you know, your ongoing certification for something, or you have to, you know, your continuing ed requirements or um, those types of things, mm -hmm. where you're working on a degree or something like that. It, and there's the um, division of continuing studies. So there's lots of units on the campus too that offer like adult oriented classes, right, that are just one-offs, like mm -hmm. uh, the Chazen or the Union or uh, any number of other places where, like, for union members and so forth, we could have, uh, offer things as well. So I, don't, I just wonder if we should, should add a bullet in there that it's about, um, yeah. it's not just the formal piece of UW Extension or Division of Continuing Studies. It could be something broader than that, too. Mm 
Right. And we might need to develop something to learn what those, all those opportunities are so we can better promote them. Yeah. Yeah. I, and the alumni association offers, you know, continuing education and classes too. And so lots of us do little things, not as formal as UW extension, but mm -hmm. yeah. Good point. Anything else about continuing education? If not, we will move to um, sustainability in co-curricular learning. So that's the third one on the list on your screen. If you want to take a minute to think about that. And what we talked about there is we want to be careful to not just add another workshop that people have to click through. Oh, wait a minute, I'm mm -hmm. looking at the wrong one. No, wrong one, sorry. Could, um, some of the challenges are related to the academic strategies that we talked about last time. That was one of the things that someone pointed out. So we might want to talk about this area in conjunction with what we discussed, look back at what we have and bring those ideas together as we're gonna move forward on this because there's definitely some connection there. Um, comment was that we need to reach beyond, again, this, the idea of the things that are obviously sustainability or environmentally um, focused, but how does sustainability fit into other kinds of classes that we might be doing or other activities that we might be doing and that sustainability and, cont and continuing leadership among students. So one of the challenges with the co-curricular learning for students is that they're always changing, they're turning over. And so keeping that leadership going can be difficult with all of that turnover. Um, so we wanna think about, you know, how's that gonna work? We want to leverage other student groups like maybe the Greek community that have their own strong alumni groups. We wanna leverage the top of the pyramid groups. So Mark, you had talked about the three tiers that you have the governing group, how can that governing group make sustainability, um, help the other you know, people creating these programs think about sustainability beyond the obvious environmental classes. That was something that was mentioned. And then have student the student advisors take a more active role, not just checking off paperwork, but actually taking a, a more active role to challenge the student leadership to maybe maintain momentum around um, sustainability and how they might kind of push the people that are organizing the projects and to challenge them. So those are some of the things that we talked about. Um, anything anyone want to add about to that one? I don't know if I want to add, but I have a question. Have we talked yes. at all about infusing uh, sustainability um, into the um, Wisconsin, I don't know if we call them the pillars of the Wisconsin experience? And, and using that as the sort of the backdrop or the framing for engaging sustainability pretty much in everything that we do in terms of the humility and the service um, component and the empathy. Um, yeah, I don't think we talked about that specifically last time um, when we talked about the academic issues, but we can certainly add that um, as something to be considered as we're moving forward. Is there something specific about that you wanted to have us include, Cheryl? Uh, uh, because I think that most of those things are either incorporated into like first year experience opportunities or otherwise co-curricular um, experiences mostly. So it just made me think that there is a potential coordinated um, relationship. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I think I like that a lot. Yeah, okay. Cheryl, I, that's a great idea, Cheryl. I like that a lot. Um, so. You're yeah. talking about the, there's those pillars to the Wisconsin experience, right? Yeah, yeah. And and one, think of that humility and empathy, but there's one other. Intellectual curiosity is one of them. And or purposeful like action. Purposeful I mean, action. It's like you yeah. could really infuse sustainability into yeah. all of them in a different way. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's a great idea. Anything else about this um, co-curricular learning piece. We only have a few minutes left, so I'd like to touch on the onboarding piece if we could for just quickly, very quickly. Um, some of the comments from the other group where we just don't want this to be like a click through training workshop kind of thing. We want it to be more active. Um, we wanna do a, a, a job of really focusing on what it is that we're doing. So we don't wanna maybe talk about sustainability generally. We want it to be focused like this is the uh, water year or the energy year or something like that. So we want to, we only have about a minute left too. So we're probably gonna get cut off here, but if anything, anyone has anything that they wanna to add to the onboarding piece here. 
I would just like to add going back really quick, and I'm so sorry, but we talked about student turnover. And if we have this like community of practice, I think it really helps with, you know, making sure that students from different groups have that. Like when I came into my position, I had a list of student orgs that I have to attend or meetings that I have to attend to. So if you have a designated space, I think it really helps with student turnover when we get into these new leadership positions, that there's a space that students know that they attend to that helps with, you know, the learning process, communication, all that stuff. Okay. I'm done. <laughs> Perfect. You got it in before we moved. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to very quickly say uh, one of the things that we talked about uh, to, to add is that we need to sequence these priorities. How do they relate to each other? Might some have to come first to leverage others? And that was the other point. So if anybody has anything else that they think is missing, you can put it in the chat when we get back in the other room. Um, we've got about 43 seconds if you want to um, get it in right now before we head back to the other group. Otherwise, I think we've got it. I'll give you a, um, I'll give you a little clue. When we come back, we're gonna do a whip around to ask everybody what their one main point that they, that's sticking with them from this conversation. So you have a few extra seconds to think about that over the other group. <laughs> I think we're just about finished here. Yeah, 10 seconds. All right, well, welcome back everyone. Um, as always, I can't see the conversation, so I apologize if I cut anyone off um, mid midstream in either, either of the groups. Um, but maybe I'll hand it over to, to Deb. Um, we'll run us through a little um, full group debrief. You're on mute, Deb. <laughs> I forget that it remutes you when you come back in. I wish it didn't do that to me. I have too many other things to think about. Um, so anyway, we, I think we had some good discussions in the two groups that we uh, had over on, on my side of the internet world. And what we'd like to do is just, I'm gonna give you a, just a few seconds to think about and then share one thing that stood out from you in this conversation. And we'll, we'll go through, I wanna make sure we hear from each of you. So I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna start. Sarah, you're next to me, so you're gonna go first. I'll give you a second to think about that. So it'll be Sarah, Chris, and then Natalie. And uh, I'll call out people as, you know, with the rest of the group as we go forward. So one thing that really jumped out at you from this conversation today that you might take with you the rest of the day or even the next hour. Um, you know, I think it's probably, I've got some recency bias, but I think it was the, the point that, that Chris just made and that, um, that we were last digesting is that um, while we are, while we're all still in kind of a really uncertain situation and sustainability could feel like an add-on or could feel like a nice to have, we do have an opportunity as we're all rebuilding and re-envisioning what the next stage of all of our work is going to be to start incrementally building some of that into, in, into the core of what we are and, and have that. So it could both seem like a really hard sell, like, wow, talking about sustainability at this time could just be extra or it could be a fundamental uh, an underlying guiding principle so so thank, thank you, you chris for firing that thought chris you're up yeah i think you know one of the themes that i heard was um, the need to prioritize whether it's our audience or the initiative um try try to gain some early wins and build some traction that can um Build some traction that can attract others uh, to to the mission. Okay, so then we're going to go Natalie, Geary, and then Michael. So Natalie, you're up. I would just say, um, besides increasing communication overall, but really increasing communication about sustainability opportunities for new students or students that may not already be involved with sustainability, and broadening that picture of sustainability. Thank you, Geary, Michael, and Cheryl. So my thought as I was listening to it, what, it, what occurred to me was that sustainability is not something, uh, uh, it, it's a value that can cut across your political beliefs, your whatever your background is, you cannot be not for sustainability. It's like part of our life and it, it, it and it's, and that's what should be the unifying thing that uh, 
that was sort of occurring in my mind I was, as I was listening. And that it's very, very important for us to listen, 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 listen. It's not something that comes from Madison out state and out the world and say, this is how we do things, but we want to listen, 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 listen. How, that was what's banging inside my head. Hey, thank you. Okay, Michael, Cheryl, and then Mark. Yeah, I think kind of going off what everyone has said, um, but especially what Gary has said is just um, like kind of paying attention to it and making it a uh, big, making it a part of our lives, not just like an add on or something that we're going to do to be nice at this event. Like this is a, a responsibility that we have that we need to do um, to survive as a race. And um, so that's one of the biggest takeaways that I think I just think about through all of this. Thanks, Michael. Cheryl, Mark, and then Jake. Uh, I really do agree with all, all of what you are saying. I think it's coming to me maybe with different words, but really the same um, essence. Uh, first of all, I'm noticing opportunities and possibilities. And, you know, I, I, I get into meetings like this and I'm like, throw it on the wall. Let's Throw a spaghetti, throw another spaghetti. Um, so that always excites me because um, we can always get rid of spaghetti. Um, we can eat it. Um, but the opportunity and the possibility is um, to shift and change behaviors. It's really embracing a value, but you're trying to um, um, change behaviors. And I wrote down two notes that are really coming to mind. This is culture shift. And are we on culture shift overload? And can we afford not to be? <laughs> uh, but I know what I do every day. I know I've been doing this thing that I'm doing every day for 30 years now, paid and, you know, otherwise a lifetime. Mm -hmm. And I got a lot of work to do every time I wake up in the morning, right? Yeah. Uh, so this yeah. culture shift is, it's really overwhelming and it, it definitely takes a, a long journey. Um, but can we afford not to move yeah. in that direction, you know, and yeah. find ways to associate sustainability with breathing, like. Thanks, Cheryl. Mark, Jake, and Emma. Uh, one of my um, great takeaways actually was from Cheryl in our last uh, session, and that was uh, when she asked, uh, have we considered uh, how we uh, in include sustainability language into the Wisconsin experience? And um, when we describe the different pillars of the Wisconsin experience for students on this campus, uh, are there concepts in there that uh, people would automatically think of as, oh, that's about sustainability, right? So uh, intellectual curiosity or purposeful action. Do we have examples of those around sustainability in the, when we describe the Wisconsin experience? And that was like a great aha moment for me. So, so thank you, Cheryl. <laughs> it's one of those pieces of spaghetti. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Jake and then Emma. I think just, I mean, piggybacking out really off what everyone has said, but uh, just the, the notion of sustainability ingrained as a, as a value for our campus and understanding that um, our priorities, our priorities as advocates for sustainability and our understanding of the concepts behind it will change over time and we should be completely open to that as an educational institution. Uh, but, um, but also understanding that it's not a check in a box. And I think about that particularly with respect to a brief discussion that our group had at the end about onboarding and uh, integrating training around these concepts. Um, it's not even just like one, you know, like the place to start is to have one session about it, but then maybe develop, um, develop more sessions over time. So um, yeah, thanks for, thanks for having me for the discussion today. Appreciate it. Thanks, Jake. Emma, you're going to get the last word, I think. I don't think I, I, mean, I think I got everybody. No pressure. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think the thing that stood out to me the most was just viewing like how we incorporate sustainability um, like into our processes now more than ever, because I mean, arguably there isn't a single campus process that's the same as it was 12 months ago. So looking at like, instead of going against a system that a lot of people argued worked perfectly fine on its own, um, like now we can incorporate sustainability into how we're rebuilding the campus and how we're choosing to like direct it into the future. I think this gives us a really great opportunity to incorporate it into like the very essence of what we do. Thanks, Emma. I think I got everybody. Did I miss anyone? 
think I got everybody. Alex, I'm going to turn it back over to you to bring us home. Great. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, just quickly on, on next steps for us, um, pretty similar again, next steps from our last meeting. Um, we will put together a nearly identical survey just with the updated engagement focus areas that we'd ask that you um, complete um, before our next uh, meeting. Um, look out in early February for kind of the next group of focus areas. This time it is uh, around um, operations, which will be our next meeting um, in February. Um, and then this last point here is make mainly an FYI. Um, we are putting together a very short just email update to our sponsors. So um, Provost Schultz and Vice Chancellor Heller, um, as we're kind of halfway through our first year and starting a new semester, just to let them know where we're at in, in our process. We will CC you all in an email so you are aware uh, of what's sent out, but didn't want you to be a surprise to anyone when the email comes across. But again, no, no actions on your part. Um, other than that, the only other thing I want to add is as we're kind of like at least in a groove in terms of process and we'll be repeating this kind of same structure for the next couple of meetings, that doesn't mean we couldn't be open to, to switching things if something's not working. So if, if anyone has, has any thoughts, um, questions or concerns about how we're structuring the conversation, preparing people for the discussion, please feel free to, to reach out. I'm happy to talk through and think through better ways to do it. So. That is it. Any last questions or comments?